Welcome to Fruiting Body Podcast, episode 11. Today we're with some Phuket refugees straight from China. Uh, this is Jen and Lex Chernock. So before we get started, let's uh, kick that intro to Lisa. Let's go. One quick thing, we found an amazing feature on YouTube. You should check this out. If you're watching this video uh, and you click on any time place on the video itself, click on the description and chapters will appear. From these chapters, you can decide what part of the podcast you would like to watch. Hope you enjoy. Subscribe, like, swipe left, swipe right, swipe up, hit the notification, do all that fun stuff. So you can get this content in real time. It's awesome. We are Fruiting Body Podcast. We're a medicinal mushroom company. The legalized stuff. Uh, we'll be coming out with some products uh, around, I think, Q3, Q4 this year. Um, but let's let's talk about that later. So for now, today we are with uh, Lex and Jen Chernock. Um, they're originally from America. And they are Phuket refugees who have been stuck in uh phuket now for about a year and a half and i'm predicting 2024 oh, yeah. so they're gonna be here for a Just while permanently um but you they're gonna call it pretty early so we're back there okay so we will jump into their story and we're gonna give you guys it's not the typical journey of people living in phuket because they're again they're refugees they're temporary they're, they're not here forever so we're gonna jump into their story and understand what happened, how they got here, and let's just walk through it step by step and, and also what they're, uh, what they're doing to get out of here. Okay, uh, Jen, Lex, I think let's start with Jen. She's on spot. She's a little bit nervous. Take it away. Uh, let's start from the beginning in China and tell us your story. Yeah, in China, we're international teachers. So we've been there for about 10 years, pretty happily. Um, got two kids. And then um, in 2019, or 2020, February, we decided to go on vacation after the whole pandemic hit. My well, mom came to visit. It wasn't hadn't quite hit yet, right? Because we started getting murmurs back in 2019 in November. Remember, yeah. There's like some weird pneumonia-like virus going around. Be careful. No one really thought too much of it, but then yeah. her mom came out for a visit. When did you guys actually land here? Was it February, February 8th? 8th. <laughs> like the day. Yeah. We, like, yeah, we know that day very well. Because yeah. <laughs> on all the immigration forms, it's like, what day did you arrive? I'm like, February 8th. Yeah. That was like... Oh, because it's probably for the China New Year you're coming out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. We put her on her plane back to America. My and, mom. And things were getting a little hairy in China. You know, um, they were restricting travel, masks everywhere. People, you know, certain Westerners, uh, foreigners were being denied at airports. Xenophobia was on the rise a bit um, as things happen, um, but no, we were just like let's 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 bounce. We're gonna we made we actually had to get out right away to Hong Kong and then secure our plane ticket. So we spent like a few days in Hong Kong. That seems like a distant memory. Yeah, they closed the border, so we went over to Hong Kong because we we decided okay, the school didn't reopen. They were online, and then they were like, we're just actually gonna extend Chinese New Year. So we thought, okay, we'll just, we'll get out and take a quick vacation. Let it blow over. <laughs> Let it blow over weeks. and then we'll come back. We'll as see soon what as happens. Yeah. yeah. So, and but then February 8th, we got here and. Of 2020. Yeah. And you've been here ever since. Yep. Ever since. Yeah. Yeah. Many. So we, we met probably around that time with m mutual friends. Uh, shout out to Mikey and Dave. <laughs> um, I used to live in Shenzhen. So I was friends with uh, two guys that I used to play hockey with in, in Shenzhen. And they were mutual friends because, uh, well, Mikey, no, he wasn't teaching at, at, at your international school. No. You probably just knew him from. No, I knew Mikey well. From, from Family Shenzhen. Mart. From Family Mart. No, from no. Family Mart. <laughs> Drinking <laughs> beers at Family Outside Mart. Family Mart. And, and playing ball hockey and basketball yeah. and, and this yeah. stuff at the international school. So they came out here. Now, did you guys come with the intention to come with Dave and Mikey or was that kind of no. a coincidence? No. It was a coincidence. They followed yeah. us. They, like, they that's a great <laughs> idea. Just like. We took a trip once to Lama Island in Hong Kong, and then we get a, uh, I get a text from Mikey. He's like, hey, we're uh, in Lama Island. Sounds like a great he idea. Just, he just copies <laughs> us. It's, a, that sounds, yeah, it's easy because he's like, all right, well, he doesn't have to plan too much. Yeah. So you guys came out with Mikey. I 
Actually, I think you guys were originally staying in Surin, right? Yeah, we, yeah. we started out in Surin. Um, and then he got a place right around the corner by yeah. uh, Kuni. And um, then Dave came shortly afterwards. And yeah. um, then they shut everything down. They shut they, down the pools here. So we were like, when, when was that? That must April. Have, April 2020. Yeah. 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 So then we headed over to Kamala for a bit. Yeah. And we, that was the new hangout. Since we couldn't go to the beach, we wanted access to a pool. So we got like a, a sweet little villa. Uh, had a couple of different units on it that we had a shared pool and we would live there for three or four months. Yeah. The nice thing was that the beach was still open at Camelot. Yeah. I mean, yeah. well, technically it was, I mean, people were still there. There were locals and you know, it was sparse. People were there exercising because surfing, that's when our son kind of got into surfing. We got yeah. our kid a surfboard. And um, so he was pretty excited to go down there and they didn't harass you if you were in the water. So. Yeah, at least there they they were. Uh, see, I I was in lockdown, but I was out. You guys, you guys were in lockdown in Camelot, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, I was in lockdown. I I don't buy blue blue tree. I don't know the name of this area. It's it's hard to pronounce. Um, so originally you guys were on the Surin side. Then you went to Camelot. This entire time when things went into lockdown, immediately like kind of what was going through your mind. I didn't know when we were going to get out. I mean, at that point, the airport had closed. So, you know. Yeah. And we were pretty um, committed to, you know, we we're focused on finishing the school year. We're working online. So we we're staying pretty busy with our day to day. And it just, you know, made us, you know, we go for walks around the neighborhood and do what we could cooked at home. The big C obviously was open. We could still go get coffees down yeah. at the Swedish baker and stuff. But um, no, we were just, you know, getting through to the end of the school year, thinking that things were going to open up. We'd get back to China sometime in the summer. And some of our colleagues were getting their PU letters, their invitation letters back to China. But we were just all last on the list for some reason, like in round two or three of getting that PU letter back to China. And by the time we finally got it, China just shut w down. What is the PU letter? Yeah, so for people who don't know, when you getting a per – we have a Z visa in China. So a Z visa, you're there, you're working, you have a valid work permit – um, and it's, we it's a work visa. It's a work visa. Yeah. It's a resident visa. It's a multi entrance. Yeah. Visa. yeah. So we were good. We had everything. Um, we finally did get our PU letter, but you have to have that that government. It's in their different per municipality. What so, does PU stand for? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking permanent. Anyways. Anyways, but they they issue them based on municipality. So like Shenzhen can they get word from the local government when they can release them. So anyways, we finally got our PU letters, but the issue getting back was they were not allowing dependents in. So we have two kids yeah. and we could get back, but they were saying that the kids couldn't come back. So that's where we kind of had this hang up where, and that's where we are today. Same, same thing. Yeah, now. But same at, the, thing. at this point, um, we go into lockdown, I think April. I mean, are, are you thinking I got to get back? Are you, are you concerned about your jobs? Is, or are you like, let's just ride this out? Like, w where were you guys with, with that? Because I'm sure there are a lot of other people that are probably still here yeah. that are in the same situation as you. Well, we're fortunate because our school is such a community-oriented school that they've done everything to keep us on board. So, And our positions are kind of... Suited for more being suited online. More suited than a lot of other positions. Yeah. Like, if you're a PE teacher or a kindergarten teacher... They're not going to keep you on to teach. Yeah, I teach design to upper yeah. middle school, and she works with other teachers and building curriculum. So it was you know, fine. Not so the school. Have to the school's o the school was. Uh, I'm going to ask a lot of questions where sure. I know the answers because I mean we've had <laughs> we've a lot of we've had a, a, a few beers on the beach <laughs> at Surin, so it's going to be a little theatrical, but enjoy. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you guys are at that that point. You're stuck in Camilla. You, you, you've your your jobs. Are you feeling secured because the uh, the school year is coming to an end, anyways? That at least you can let's ride Give it out through time. the summer and yeah. see what happens. Exactly, and I think that they gave us pretty much some good assurance that we would be yeah. we would be hired on Constant and that we would get back. Resources. But there were some low times. I mean, there was there definitely were. times where they were thinking we weren't going to get and, back, and, and lots of yeah. lots of uncertainty about. What's the what's the rules going to be like next week? You know, what's going to change? Yeah. We, oh, like sometimes we didn't even know that we're going to be able to extend our amnesty. Uh, yeah. Tourist extension. The here. visa here yeah. in Thailand. To there stay. was times you had yeah. no idea if. Well, am I just going to have to bounce back to America? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. And why we didn't go back to America? I mean, I think if you're looking at uh, that time on lockdown, all the you couldn't get in or out of Phuket, so there was no no way to get back out yeah and it's that's that's not something good that thailand did they gave you guys that option to extend because amnesty, a lot of places yeah. like uh, malaysia did not 
they kicked everyone out. They said, well, if your visa's done in 90 days, uh, and that was with one of my friends, uh, Al, he he was also in in, uh, Shenzhen, and he had to get kicked out, and he went off to, I think, Mexico, Nicaragua. Oh, really? So you're living like kind of month to month kind of on the edge. Has it been like that the entire time? Yeah, I think so. It's been uh, like that the entire time until recently, where we kind of... I think we've just sort of accepted our lot and just go with the flow. We have understand what our means are. We're like, uh, you know, we're not saving a lot, but we're, we're still able to um, perpetuate our, our living standards. And, you know, ha- we're, we feel so blessed in a lot of ways because we have the beach, we have this recreation, you know, learning to surf. Evie and I, uh, we're boogie boarding buddies. You know, that's, his, that's our daughter. And I'm from Hawaii, so I get to share some of my childhood growing up and learning to respect and, and honor the ocean and learning how to play and enjoy it and, you know, learning how to read waves and talking about it and, and like, looking at it and how to yeah. enter the ocean. and Yeah, so at least, like... It's something you're familiar with as well. It's not like you're stuck in Japan in the snow mountains and maybe yeah. it's a bit yeah. more out of your element. It's out of my element. I'm from Kansas. Yeah. So <laughs> this is like, but this it, is like, isn't the everything out of your element if you're <laughs> yeah, from Kansas? <laughs> so, but no, I think it is good. I, for me too, I think, um, cause we had already always contemplated maybe moving to Hawaii and mm-hmm. living. I said, I can't live on an island. I'd go crazy, but apparently I can. I can survive living on But it's life. still something in the back of your mind is still temporary. There's no is, there's yeah. no mm-hmm. thing in your mind where this is this is permanent well, yet. No, be, yeah, <laughs> because <laughs> because we're still paying our rent in yeah. China. We have we're boarding our cats. We yeah. are we have a fully furnished apartment with all of our things. We came here for 10 days with like, you know, backpack. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, I've bought a few Hawaiian shirts since yeah. I've been here because I have to have something to something. to wear when I'm you know, I, I teach my classes through Microsoft Teams. And so you got to wear a collared shirt. Yeah. And. Uh, but I think, it, you know, when you ask if it feels temporary, I think actually for a long time it did. And I think that's where all that anxiety for me personally, like I had sleepless nights thinking mm. about like what's going to happen, what's going to change next. But I think the big takeaway from everything and, and COVID and is that, Everything is the only constant in life is change. Actually, you know what? Everything is temporary. What are we? What are we even talking about when we say that? Um, you know, I got that's nice. I like oh, that. we forgot about that. Yeah, we didn't even turn <laughs> off the spotlights. Doesn't that feel darker in here now? Yeah, it does but feel it, darker. But how it's does like, that look on the thing? We're mood setting. Looks yeah. better. Yeah. Sorry, we we've had a bit of a hiccup for uh, a week. Our our videographer <laughs> had a bit of an injury, so we took we took some time off. He's recovering. Any any doctors out there that can do a meniscus <laughs> surgery for like <laughs> twenty baht, hit us up. Uh, that's what we're looking for right now. You got the so, lighting. It could become a surgery. Yeah, you know, we, we could actually do it right in here. <laughs> so. Um, so we're looking for a meniscus doctor out there. This goes out to anyone at Tiger. If you know people or Chalong, uh, hit us up and we'll uh, we'll bring in the podcast and like all ten of our viewers will watch. <laughs> So let's let's get back to Jen. So you're talking about those sleep, continue on those sleepless nights because of is this permanent? Is this temporary? Yeah. But I think the big realization, the one thing, you know, how you always have to be grateful for what you have. And I think with COVID, it just made me realize that really life is just I mean, everything's temporary. You're not here forever. Mm. So there's nothing that is permanent. That's quite deep. I know. I know. <laughs> but but I think that that's one thing that kind of made me change perspective, because for me, it was challenging. I'm, I mean, I got kids. We're a family. You want to plan, you, you think, you know, you, you think you have this control over your career and your future, but in reality, something like this can just boom. And there you are. And you really have to. And I, I, let, let's be fair. I mean, it, it's not the worst place to be traveling. No, for. not at all. That's why I'm saying we're it's super the, grateful. It's been the saving grace. It's yeah. just like, I, well, how long do we have to be stuck here before I bought a ukulele and then I bought uh, a boogie board and yeah. then I bought another boogie board and then I bought a surfboard for Oscar and then I bought a guitar. And so it's just like yeah. those things that keep you busy and teaching the kids, you know, these certain skills outside of school and everything else, yeah. um, sharing some of that knowledge and just being a tighter family unit. It's been really rewarding yeah. in a lot of ways. So, I mean, yeah, it sucks. We can't go home. We can't do our job the way we want to in person, the way it's meant to be done. But we still feel very fortunate yeah. for our, our, you know, our school letting us. We're, we're probably the only people outside of China still working for your school in China for mm. uh, you know a year and a half. We've been teaching online, 
And most people just had to cut ties and move on. So what's the situation now? I mean, uh, summer holidays are are getting close to an end for you guys. I'm assuming you're starting in August ish. So you got to go back online. Have, what have they, they explained to you? What's, what's next? Well, we had a conversation the other day because, um, the, we can get back now too, because we've had the vaccine, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, but the kids still can't get back. Um, so that kind of came to a point in discussion with our director. And he said, you know, we're, we're happy to keep you guys online for this year. It's guaranteed, but, but so that this coming school year, but he said after that, we just, we just can't, right? Like, which is fair, which is fair. Absolutely fair. They've been more than fair. I think the main issue is though, that they're struggling on their end because people are bouncing from China too, because there's people who are now, you know, these international teachers go there thinking, okay, well, every year I can return back to my home and see my family. But there's people who've been there for two years and they can't get out. Like they can't travel home to see their family. So trapped in China, trapped in China. Yeah, so yeah. there's, I mean, it's, it's really, you know, of course it's a choice. Like they could have, they could, they could have cut could ties break. and go home, but yeah, they, so you, you know, got they, the better side of the coin at least. I think sure, so. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you could have been trapped in China and not, you know, and that's, that's very rough because at least it, from, for myself living in China, you look forward to your vacations mm, and yeah. when you leave, but I could not imagine being in China and every vacation that comes up, you can't go anywhere. That, you can't even travel. Like, cause there's those, yeah. there's floods now. And yeah, you're not even supposed to do much uh, in within China. Oh, wow. Yeah. So what's going on with that? Oh, there's these huge floods with the, in, um, I don't know what city it is right now. Is it the like Shanghai area? Like, I don't know, but they're, they're terrible floods. These poor people. And like, so there's there's that, and then they're they're having you know crop ups of COVID again too. So it's not like they've escaped that either. They're still so they're trying to keep people's movement within China restricted as well. Um, so. There's definitely times in around early part of this year when it looked like things were better. Our friends were getting back to their normal lives, going out to you know uh, restaurants and just carrying on as normal. But then it started to ramp up again, and then so sometimes you know. You think, oh, I wish we could have just got back. I wish we could have got back. Then other times, then they're ramping up, you know, doing weekly. Uh, you have to do weekly nucleic acid tests. Yeah. And you have to have. What like is that a, exactly? You know, they, they, the nose. The, 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 COVID the, nose. Test, the COVID test. Okay. The yeah. COVID test. And you have to have like an app that shows that you have a, a, a negative test. And that that's, they have to keep up with that weekly. Basically. There that was is, a point in time. Yeah. That's yeah. insane. Yeah. yeah so the people though. like even getting in and out of your apartment complex, people were having like a hard time. Oh, you couldn't bring in guests. Yeah, you couldn't bring in guests. You and this is still going on in China, in it's, Shenzhen now or? It's hit or miss. Like I think it's okay now, but towards the end of this school year. So in like May and June, it was crazy. They were like daily rounding up the kids and doing, or weekly at least rounding up everybody and making them do a COVID test. Mm. So, yeah. So, so, so now y- you guys have you guys have done the you've you've had yeah, so you guys have done the vaccine. Uh, obviously, your, your kids they're not allowed to do the vaccine, correct? No, I think because our children are twelve and and seventeen. So Sinovac, even though it's approved for, and just to be clear, like the only vaccine that you can get into China with right now is with a Sinovac, um, or a, you can have a PU letter, and you don't need to be vaccinated to get in yeah. with that. Um, but you're better off if you have both because. Um, one step is, yes, you can get the visa, but can you actually travel there? Because they issue the travel code. Mm. So you really do have to have the vaccine and the PU letter. But the kids, they are requiring the kids also have the vaccine. But they're not really giving children vaccines right now. And they won't give them to the children in Phuket. No, no. it's not mm. even possible. No. So then if they don't have the vaccines, then they can't get in. No, but we're hoping... Pfizer has been, I think, BioNTech. Is they're going to start manufacturing BioNTech within China? So if they do that, the yeah. Pfizer vaccine, if they start having using that vaccine within China, they'll probably allow that. And when does that? When when should that be happening? I don't know. That conversation started months ago. It did, and then the uh, the lady who gave us the jab at the uh, in Patong, she said next month they'll start offering Pfizer in Phuket. Who knows if that's yeah. true or not? There's a lot of hearsay. That's that's hard of it too. It's like so much misinformation, so much hearsay about what's happening with whatever policy or uh, rule change yeah. that you just kind of okay. 
take a mental note, but don't put much stock in it. Like, so, so then what happens at the start of the school year? You're back online and that's secure. Are they, are they ready to drop a bomb on you day mm -hmm. one? I don't think so. I don't think so. Like we have a, we have a good uh, relationship and we've built up a lot of trust with our uh, director and the community in general. They all want us back. They know we've tried very hard to get back. We've done everything we can to keep them abreast about what we're doing. What are, we have like a visa agent who's giving us more accurate information. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, very close contact with our HR department. Um, so, yeah, when we start back up, I, I get my roster, my kids, make my class and my teams. And I've got a I've got an in-person representative mm -hmm. to help get my, me connected to the iPad. I'm projected up on the screen. Yeah. I do breakout sessions with individual students to give uh, feedback and stuff. And yeah. it's not ideal, but as a design teacher... Yeah it's probably one of the better courses to do online and learn to have these like communication skills through the computer, which is, you know, is valuable these days. It's something everyone's going to have to deal with moving mm. forward. Yeah. And, and shout out to Lex. I mean, he, he did our design here. I don't know if, if you want to <laughs> shoot to that, at least he was, uh, he helped us with our logo, Muay Thai and mushrooms and this beauty over there too. I like that one. The Muay Thai youth foundation. Um, yeah, we've been meaning to bring them on for a, a while. We were just kind of waiting. We we're going to have some guests today that are from the Sandbox. Um, but they were waiting on some test results. So maybe we'll get them on next week. And then we kind of wanted to tie these two uh, podcasts together. Refugees and Sandboxers. And to be fair, we're, we're not really, I mean, we're way better off than most refugees. Yeah, refugees. Yeah. It's kind I of feel, a bad word. I feel bad using like, that because no. there's actual refugee. <laughs> but isn't, well, I mean, is that, would that be the term? Is it derogatory? See, I, I'm no, I no, just but think just the way worse. Like, yeah. So like, what are we? What not, should we brand it as? I don't know. We're not living See? in a tent city. We're living in paradise. So it seems ass? like an, a little bit long-term tourists. <laughs> no, perpetual. Perpetual tourists. Perpetual tourists. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we're locals now. See, we're back at yeah. refugees. See, <laughs> 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 makes things much easier. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well. and. and um, what, what about your options of going back to the States? Was that an option or, and why not? We really, really weighed the pros and cons of that. Um, I think towards the end of this last school year, our daughter, you know, she entered middle school. Um, you know, she, she transitioned from lower uh, elementary school to middle school. And Which so now she's awful. got six, like it's seven the worst different, age. eight different teachers. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. under normal circumstances. Right. And so she really, really struggled. She's really a social creature and she likes to like bounce ideas off of people and feed off of other people. And so just, it was, it was a, a grind to get through the entire school yeah, year online. For sure for her. And by the end, she was just done. She was over it. And so we were really, and we've already considered like sending her back. She really kind of longs for that American experience. experience. She's been in China since she's three. So she has never really had that American yeah. school experience. And she's speaking fluent Chinese. Yeah. Uh, not much. I mean, no one really picked up Thai even for no. myself. No, 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 our Thai is not very good. It's embarrassing. We've been yeah. here too long and not know. No, no but most people don't, know, to still, be honest. Yeah. I mean, we know the basics. But so no, we really were, we were strongly considering, you know, doing the, we go re-up our 60-day uh, visa extension here next week. And after that, we were saying, we're going to just go to America if we can't get back to China. We're not getting any answers. Yeah. So that yeah. she can go enroll in person school but then we are still having to teach online. That means we get, we finish our day at 1 a.m. at night and we're just like, yeah, yeah. how long can we sustain that? And like, no. no, the work day, I can't do that. I'm a, I'm a morning person. So yeah. like I, the sun comes up, I'm up, the sun goes down, I'm like done. So I'm very driven by that. So in the, in the U.S. it would definitely be like starting work at like 4.35 p.m. and working till one, even on the West Coast. So. Yeah, that would it, it, that's too intense. I've done that before, and yeah. we've talked about that. But my God, I mean, going uh, working at night, it, it's a it's a bit of a nightmare. Yeah. And, and for the kids too, if they were on, well, I guess they would go to school. Well, she would, but Oscar's in his senior year, so he's got to finish his DP program. Yeah, um, it's an IB school, so yeah, he's got to finish his uh, diploma program, and then yeah, who knows? Like it's hard to think too far in the future because <laughs> we're just trying to get through the next visa extension yeah. or the next uh, semester, you yeah. know, whatever. Mm. So what was it like te teaching online? Now, um, we'll go into Jen's stuff in a second more as like the coordinator. Yeah. But I mean, for yourself, I mean, teaching online from the teacher's perspective, which most parents that maybe if they're watching this podcast, 
they have the child's perspective because they've seen the child at the table from the computer. But from the teacher's perspective, can you kind of explain that a little bit? It's, I mean, it can be very similar. There's still the gamut of, of, of student interactions, the ones that are more proactive, the ones that ask more questions, that seek the feedback. And that's some, that's some of the feedback I usually give my students is you need to seek and apply feedback. You don't always have to take the suggestions you receive, but that you're actively pursuing and, and, and reflecting on some of your um, your practices, your whatever mm. you're doing. But advocating for themselves. Advocating for yourself is huge. So, yeah. and, I, and I, I try to, you know, I have to do, I have to do force breakout sessions for someone who's falling behind, haven't turned in some assignments. So I'll, I'll get the class started, give them what we're doing for the day, the overview for the next you yeah. know, few lessons. And then, you know, I'll be, I say, I'm standing by if you have any questions. If I'm not getting a lot of questions, then I will just break out of the group and I'll call an individual student, either ask them to throw on their headphones or step out into the hall. And I'll just have a little one-to-one -one with them, just like I would do in person. Mm -hmm. So, um, like I said, I think it's... But a you're good, doing that not during the class. The during one, the class. During the class of one-on-one, -on -one, and then the kids are... There's somebody on the ground. There's somebody on the ground. Okay. So, yeah, I have my co-teacher on uh, okay, in so. the classroom facilitating, making sure that their screens are what their screen should be. Because in design, yeah. you know, there's a lot of time. You know, we do a lot of uh, research to build up your ideas to develop the uh, the concepts, to be more informed with your design choices, and then there's a lot of practical time. I you know I don't want them to have to work too much outside of class. So but I give are, a lot are of these are these kids like so they're in the classroom now, mm -hmm. right? Oh yeah. Are you on a projector? Yep. Okay, yep. but and what about before that? Before they were in the classroom, the like in terms of classroom management and how how did that dif differentiate from like being physically in the room? Because I'm sure there was a point in time where you were teaching everybody online was online and everybody was online. Yeah. Oh yeah, when we, that was tough. It was a shorter period of time, but um, uh, that was a ha more difficult when the kids were online yeah. and I was online, obviously, because yeah. um, you you can't you can't really do the breakouts so well. You most you almost have to like schedule another time to to have those individual conferences. Um, God, it seems like a distant memory when we were doing but it. Those like when you're in that type of environment, like are all the kids, do they have their webcams on? Are they turned on? Are they turned yeah, off? That's hell. Trying to no. get them to keep everything on. They don't want to turn it on. Yeah. When, really? when, we, when everyone was at home and on, working from, from their computers, you have to come on guys. Let me just at least check in. Let me <clears> see your face. Um, and some teachers are more strict about it than others. But um, the, the idea is that you should have your camera on if we're all in class together. Unless it's like, all right, guys, I know you're going to be working on Photoshop or Illustrator. So go ahead and, and, and if you need anything, let me know. Otherwise, you know, we'll just break off and, and I'll talk to the people that I need to. So, yeah. you know, I like to treat them, give them some autonomy and treat them like adults and, and respect that they're doing the things necessary to... They're older kids. Yeah, it's not I, like they're elementary school yeah, kids. I couldn't imagine trying to do so. it with well, anything less than a you know, grade eight. Would it student. be fair to say, or, or could you say that like, okay, pre-COVID, physically in the classroom, you see a certain progression, right? And during uh, these virtual classes, that progression rate uh, diminishes a little bit because you're not physically there. Is that fair to say, or was it the same? I had some excellent results. I had some of the best submissions in design that I've ever had for some of the projects. Um, so it, it's hit and miss. It's the kids that need that little, if I'm not walking around, looking over their shoulder, making sure they're on task, th some of those kids kind of fall through the cracks. Yeah. But they might have tended to fall through the cracks a little bit anyways. So um, that's the part I miss is just being able to respond immediately to just you know monitoring the classroom, walking around, looking over the shoulders. I don't get to look over the shoulders. Yeah. I have to like... Show me what you got. Show me what you got. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, I think it's the relationship. Rick and Morty. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I caught that one. Uh. Yeah, no, I, I mean that 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 seems like it would be the 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 most difficult aspect of that if if you're not there to watch them to push them and and a lot of these kids can just turn off the webcam and go on their phone and go lay on the couch. That's or, what they do anyway. Oh, yeah, right. in class. I mean, like yeah. to be perfectly fair, I think, and I'm kind of a revolutionary about education, so I don't necessarily think that having a school building where kids come and clock in and clock out is also, it's not also not the most effective use or I don't, I don't know, path for kids. So I do think with COVID though, and we kind of learned collectively that you could do a lot more, not even being there than you thought you could. So people were getting pretty innovative. And I think even for some kids, the, you know, that, that medium worked better for them. Mm -hmm. So I think, 
I think it was good for us to kind of have a wake up call to see like, okay, we don't have to do status quo with education like we thought we did, like a bricks and mortar school where you're showing up every day. So, yeah, and and on on your side, you're just coordinating this all, and in the school, there there was no issues. They're saying, okay, Jen, you can continue with your job. Just keep uh, keep everything in line. Yeah, I mean, I I don't work with students anymore. I I work with teachers, so I'm a curriculum coordinator and coach. So. Um, since we use the IB framework, the international baccalaureate framework, it's, it's pretty complex. So you do kind of need somebody, um, to stay on top of everything and make sure everybody's on, on pace. So I just met with teams of teachers online and they were amazing. I, I have amazing people to work with. They're super collaborative and my job was pretty straightforward. So. Yeah, and, and that, are you creating the framework or you're working with uh, like an established protocol that they've, they've given you, kind of like a, a user manual, and then you're, from there, you're, you're managing the teachers? No, it's definitely a collaborative building thing. So the IB is very much like there is a framework there um, and in a philosophy, but it's, it's not built. So it, it, it's very much contextual per school. So it's up to the schools to kind of build, a, you know, their units. And I work with the, the, the lower grades, the elementary school. So yeah. it's pretty complex. They have, you know, one in their classrooms, they're going to be doing a unit that deals with science, social studies, math, all integrated, um, really kind of connected. So it's, it's pretty complex to deal with. And, you know, I, and are you reviewing the material, the unit, uh, or, or, or those units they will be studying? And are you approving all that? I don't approve. It. I mean, I guess I do approve, but I'm more of a coach. Okay. So it's more of like, because the IB philosophy is so what we call inquiry based, where kids are, you know, um, asking a lot of questions. It's not like, here's a standard, you know, you, you get there, check the box. It's yeah. more about individual growth and individual. Are, are you more of a coach or a consultant? A cult coach. A coach. I, I'm and, definitely and a coach. You're, and you're coaching the pr the program corner coordinators within the within the school. Yeah, itself. the 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 grade level leads. Yeah, so I for each you. grade yeah. level lead, I kind of coordinate with yeah. them and their teams, and just make sure they're getting the things that they do need to get done. But also, like, what are your ideas? What do your kids need? Okay, this is how we can do this. Here are the strategies. So and and how is that that work doing that online? Because I'm assuming if you're physically there, you're in a board, let's like call it a boardroom, and maybe you're in a meeting with ten people, but people's egos and their attention spans can take over and that can be very difficult to grasp to grasp during a virtual meeting yeah have you noticed that being an issue and like how do you handle that not at all i think for me like is and being in leadership is you really have to and it's a coach like i've learned a lot from coaching actual sports yeah. and being a part of sports and and bringing that into leadership because it is really about yeah, sometimes you're going to have to drop the hammer and be a jerk. Like you're going to have to be like, you're going to have somebody you're going to butt heads with, but that's going to go well if you're proactively cultivating a relationship of collaboration and trust with that person. So you guys have to be on the same team. Like no matter what, we have to have the same vision. We have to have the same shared understanding. So we know where we're going so that when we, we're going to inevitably have problems, yeah. but we trust each other enough that we're going to work. We know we're working to solve that problem together versus. So you combating. work well with your colleagues and oh, they yeah. understand what you, you, you're, you're helping for the better. Yeah, of course. And I think that, you know, like I said, I'm really fortunate that I, I have amazing team mm -hmm. teams of people and, to work and with. And how did you get, get into that initially? What was your, your background and your lead up of employment to put you in that position? I've been in a lot of uh, my background. I have a master's in, in education and leadership so, um, you know, I actually was an art teacher for a long period of time. And a lot of that is community work you have as an art teacher. There's a lot of what you teach in the classroom that connects in China in U S in, in the U S yeah. And in China. Um, so I think that idea of creating community and building relationships through the arts really kind of carried me into leadership positions. So I've always kind of been in leadership position positions yeah. in, in the schools I've worked for. So. And we'll digress a little bit of that on, on one point there. And this question is for both of you. And uh, if the Chinese government is watching, we'll probably watch your language <laughs> a little bit. And maybe if the U.S. government is as well. What, what is the major difference between the U.S. and the Chinese education system? We, we don't teach within a Chinese framework necessarily. We're uh, because international it's more schools. Yeah. So it's, mm, it's, we're definitely, that's we true. don't feel that presence really. That's true. We that, do have to, we do have to, you have to meet the local requirements. Like there's definitely Chinese government involvements. They come and check out the school, the Shenzhen Educational Bureau comes in and make sure everything's good. 
Um, the difference is if you're looking at the types of education, um, it's in China, um, it's very much kind of almost like, I don't want to assume too much because I'm not an expert in, in this type of thing, but I have read quite a bit and done a, a little bit of research. You know, it's okay to copy. It's okay to emulate. There's a, there's a teacher and the, what the teacher says is exactly what you do. Yeah. There's not really a lot of room for individual questioning. Um, it's repetition. It's repetition and rote memorization, yeah. standardized test taking. Um, Those are cultural things. That's not necessarily like a government <coughs> mandate. or No, I would say that's definitely a cultural thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's but it, it does, does it work or doesn't it work? I think you have to value all of that. And I don't know if I'm going to refer to something like Bertrand Russell's and he's a philosopher about education. And um, he wrote a book about that. Like it's not saying any one way is right. You have to kind of honor the different types and approaches to education and learning and how we construct knowledge and that the best systems kind of pull from everything. And, so. and you know, cater to the certain strengths of individuals. Everyone's a little bit different. Yeah. Somebody would, is going to learn from copying the masters or whatever. Yeah, some people will learn that way. And though maybe, are, are though, would you, and again, I, I'm just thinking out loud, like, are, are those systems in China where it's more rep, repetition, are those created because of the culture? So that's why that system works, meaning that system might not work in Finland. It might not work yeah. in the U.S. Definitely. Is, is, there, is there like a... a connection there absolutely i don't think so yeah i think for sure that's what we're kind of like in our student body at our school is they're foreign passport holders but the vast majority of them are chinese nationals too so we're constantly having to work with the parent community and honor their understanding of education but also say yes we understand that this is kind of what you grew up with culturally but here's a different perspective and we're this is what kind of we embrace and so it's it can be challenging at times for sure. Educating the parents has been like a, a difficult but rewarding endeavor yeah. and learning how like our approach as an international school is to education. But you, you get these Chinese kids that come into the international school with a foreign passport from uh, <laughs> some African country yeah. or Hong Kong. And they're usually, I mean, everyone knows about these loopholes. Um, and, that, and then that's how they get in because if you are if you're a Chinese with a Chinese passport, you can't get into the international schools. They have to go to the Chinese schools. Yeah. However, uh, the international schools, the education is much better than the Chinese schools education. So the parents know that and they want to get them into the international. Schools. I wouldn't. I don't know if it's better. Their, if their main goal is to get these kids to go to uh, Chinese university. No, no. To go to American, Canadian, British universities, then they put their kids into international that, schools. That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they come to our school because they want to matriculate to the United States mm -hmm. or Canada or the UK, so it, somewhere else. So these are people who want to prepare their students to move yeah. overseas. That doesn't mean that the Chinese system isn't good. It just means that, and oftentimes too, this is their second or third child. Like you can't just, you. I don't know the, all of the laws, but I think it's more challenging to get good education beyond one or two children. Like it, it you know, so I yeah. think there's a lot of factors and I don't want to make any assumptions about the Chinese system. I think it can be perfectly good. There's good schools and awesome universities there that, you know, it's just, it's a, it's different, I yeah. guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and, and again, that, that ties in with like the cultural side of that as well yeah. and, and why it is different. And I'm sure there's many different systems around the whole world in, in Indonesia or maybe in, in Africa or, or even like different education systems, for example, in, in Finland. Are you familiar with the education system in Finland? Yeah, we work with some Finnish is, teachers. Is, what, what is the major difference between their approach? Because I think it's growing. Um, it's becoming more popular online. I would say over the past 10 years, they really are pushing, hey, this Finnish system, it's working. What is the Finnish system and how is it different than the American? Yeah, so it's actually similar to kind of what we do. The International Baccalaureate, and I'm not a spokesperson and yeah. I don't know how licensed I am to say this, but it is an international framework that was created um, by people from the UN and um, everything after in the 60s, but based on like this idea after World War II that we really want to develop develop globally minded people like that are going to make the world a better place that are going to be able to be successful. Um, and I think some of that comes from, you know, those European countries like Finland who have a strong foundation in education and philosophy. And so there are a lot of similarities. It's it's very inquiry based. It's mm -hmm. like 
a lot of questioning, a lot of individual um, support for students. So you're differentiating. You're not teaching to the middle. You're teaching so that all children can grow and develop. So, mm. and you're supporting those different types of learning. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, I think the Canadian school system is probably similar to the American as yes. well. I, I find as I look back on it, I felt that these school systems were quite competitive. I felt like you were always in competition with not just yourself, but with others to get into the universities. Yeah. And there's a certain point in those uh, when you're in high school where you realize unless you, there's certain schools that if you don't have like a 95% average, you can't get in. And when you try to get a 95% average in public education, it's near impossible. It's unless <laughs> it's yeah. not easy. No, it's, it's not easy. It's yeah. very difficult. Oh, sure, sure. Like probably 5% of these people from your class, like your entire class will get into the, will, ha will graduate with that um, level of, you know, uh, of grade. Yeah. Or grade themselves. So I found that that competition was, it was quite um, uh, stressful as well. So would you feel like in Canada, and I'm assuming it's similar, that there's the competition comes down from the university? Like, yes. Like basically, university entrance dictates what happens in high school, which dictates what happens in middle school, which dictates what happens in elementary school. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much only about grade <laughs> 10, 11, and 12. That's yeah. it. That's all that matters. Mm -hmm. The rest doesn't matter. Yeah. And it's do you have plus 90s if yeah. you do not you're not getting into a top 10 yeah right and it's a bit subjective as well because yes there are kids that that are smart and they were getting plus 90s and i know a lot of people from high school and i look back at them now and like they're doing absolutely nothing so yeah. actually grades don't measure success no absolutely not and i think we've moved away from yeah that. we've moved away we, from as, as a as a as a especially in the states too i mean there is a big movement i don't know what you could say about sports and getting into university like that dictates a lot. It drives too. a lot. Yeah. I mean, universities are flawed. I think it's a lot of a money-making machine, especially in the U S in the U S. Yeah. Yeah. Canada does not know it's sports doesn't really drive university in Canada. And that's and even in America. It's only a few like those top upper echelon, those yeah, huge, yeah. huge schools, you know, but, um, I don't know. I, th I, I valued my, my sports experiences, yeah. even though I had some, uh, not so great high school experiences as well. There's lots of learning experiences, but um, mm -hmm. just the dynamic of being part of a team, keeping uh, students accountable, uh, a reason for them to get good grades so they can participate. Um, Was there a lot of pressure on, on sports at your high school to help drive to get to university on scholarships? Absolutely. For me. Is it that all across the entire No, US? it depends. That there's a, I don't know. Like, what are the tiers? Like, double A? and. Uh, for high school, yeah, yeah, there's four A. There's I think there's five A schools. Tier tier one, division one, two, three, four. Right. Well, Something in high like school, that. so it's like four A, five A, and three A. Those <laughs> are like just how big the school is, how many students are in there. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know. I you know I was never a teacher in America, so I, I can't really speak. And I was a student, you know, hundred years ago. Yeah, um, <laughs> hundred years ago. <laughs> So, yeah, I don't know. It was it wasn't ever in the cards for me to get a scholarship to go play basketball or anything. I just mm. ended up going to a community college and walking into the gym is like, oh, yeah, I can run with these guys. So I, I, I and, and were you yeah. playing uh, uh, basketball in college as well? Yeah, I just played at a, a Santa Barbara Community College. Santa Barbara. That's California, California, yeah, yeah. California. OK, um, one. So we, we can dive into this as, as well. But the, the biggest part that we like to, to well that I like to discuss on, on this podcast is uh, the journey and usually it's the journey from um, your, your home country or wherever you came from to Phuket but in this case it's it's not it would be from U.S. to China which is still that story is relevant yeah so let's let's jump into that and I don't know who's going to take the lead here but <laughs> I, I, I would like to, we want to understand like how did you make the decision to go to China in the first place? And the reason oh we asked that question is because there are a lot of, uh, like, there's definitely not a lot of listeners out there right now, but <laughs> maybe in the future. But let's say you have the high school teachers that are in the U.S., in Kansas, in California, in Hawaii, in, well, Phoenix, let's, let's not bring that up now. But, <laughs> but in, in, these, in these, these cities in the U.S., and... They're thinking, you know what? I want to get the hell out of here. What yeah. are my other options? Where can I go? But maybe they're too overwhelmed with information and the amount of steps they need to take. So 
just run with it. And you guys, the journey again, sorry to, to reframe that question, the journey of how did you go from us and get to China mm -hmm. and piece that all together for us? Yeah. So we were living in Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, she somehow convinced Rob me to Chuck J. Hulk. Okay. You, uh Oh, I don't know what that means. Uh, um, so yeah, she was working at a school in Shawnee Mission West, at uh, Shawnee Mission West and the Shawnee Mission School District, which is a really good school district uh, nationally. Um, good job. A little bit of a commute. I was working odd jobs and actually staying home. So, sorry, this is Kansas City. Well, outside of Kansas City, so oh. west of Kansas City. This is where it gets confusing because yeah. of the states. <laughs> well, Kansas City. Because Trump totally messed that up. <laughs> Um, so let's explain that. Okay, so Kansas City. I grew up in Kansas City. Okay, but but Kansas City is not. You go ahead. It's Sorry, in yes. Fault. I know I, where I you're excited. finding the confusion because it it it. it it goes into Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri. So it spreads over. It's right on the state line. So the can the the whole Kansas City metropolitan area is like half of it's in Missouri, half of it's in Kansas. Ah, okay. And yeah. the Chiefs and the Royals play in Missouri. In Missouri, which is the KC Mo side. But they are Kansas City. They're Kansas all City. Kansas City. But they represent uh, Missouri, the state of Missouri. Uh, I mean, uh, no, Kansas also gets behind it because we don't have course. any, there's no other major cities. I mean, I guess other than like Wichita. So then, so you guys are in Kansas city on the Kansas side or the Missouri side? We're actually further West of Kansas city. Lawrence, it, Kansas. Lawrence, like Kansas. Okay. It's actually a historic town because mm -hmm. just, just brief history with All the right. civil war. Love the it. reason the civil war started was be one of the major reasons that it kind of ignited your great, great, no, no, it's, <laughs> uh, no. Kansas entered the Union as a as a free state. Missouri was a slave state. So what ended up happening in Lawrence, which is just it's in Kansas, west of Kansas City, um, was kind of this big bastion of freedom and like anti slavery. Whereas right over the river, you had Missouri, which was a slave holding state. Okay. So we had these things called Quantrell's raids. So basically, what, yeah, what does that mean? It's these free people who wanted to be like you know have a free anti-slavery they would go over and like firebomb and like start fires on the missouri side and vice versa they'd come over and do the same thing in kansas so um lawrence is a historic town because um that's kind of where that whole thing happened on the kansas side outside of yeah is 40, there a rival is there a rival oh my god in oh, kansas city like between missouri and oh, yeah. mizzou uh actually is there like a line that if you cross yes it's like and, and do the accents change? Or? Oh, yeah. Missouri, I mean. Yeah, I guess a bit. My yeah. God. Sign me up. That's where I'm oh, going. Back, <laughs> back when they used to have uh, University of Missouri, or the Mizzou, whatever they call them, themselves, the Tigers. Yeah. The hu they were used to be in the same conference, and the huge rivalries every time they played against, especially in football. And college sports. And college sports. So. And they, the, okay, so Quantrell <laughs> was this, like, asshole confederate confederate guy and like people in missouri today would hold hold up signs and they'd be like quandrell was a hero at like sports events and he he stormed into lawrence and burnt down the town a bit and which is the free yeah. yeah so anyway crazy rivalry. so he was a confederate yeah yeah so there's crazy rivalry and and even though like my family's <laughs> from kansas city kansas and kansas city missouri all over but it's definitely people are like kc mo and other people are like kck mm. so yeah I'm excited to go there. <laughs> the barbecues are cool really city. good. It is, it is a cool city. <laughs> but we lived in Lawrence, which is outside. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, so, so we'll go back. So you are, you're teaching in Lawrence. I was teaching in Kansas City, but we lived in Lawrence. Oh, wow. Okay. It's not uh, that far. It's, it's like not far. 40 minutes. 40, 40 yeah, I've had too many coffees. Okay, yeah. continue. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. So she's teaching. I'm raising the kids, um, getting them to school, and I'm working odd jobs in the, uh, you know, because am I going to pay... Am I going to work so that I can pay for daycare or am I just going to take care of my kids and build a better relationship with them? So yeah. it's easy decision for me. Um, then working at nights and weekends, odd jobs as a rep. And uh, what year was this about? Uh, we moved to Kansas in 2007. Mm -hmm. 2007? Until yeah. 2012. Well, Sounded like some Ka Kansas accent came out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're in there 2007. Uh, you, you just had Oscar at this point? Uh, Oscar was already... Around. He was born in Arizona. Um, yeah. And he was going into uh, preschool and when we moved to uh, Kansas. Evie, Evie was born a few years, well, 2009, uh, two years after we moved to Lawrence. And so, you know, he's getting ready to go into elementary school, taking him, walking him down the street to Pickney Elementary School. Very good school. Yep. And... Um, 
Um, so she's, you know, I'm, I'm raising her. Jen's going to sc- uh, you know, her commute over into Kansas City. Yep. And then, like I said, I'm working night jobs, weekend jobs. Um, what, type, what type of jobs are you doing at that point? I was, I did uh, basketball refereeing. Um, I did, what else did I? Oh, I worked at Owens Flower Shop. Good fl- uh, plug for <laughs> wonderful flower shop. Local, <laughs> locally owned and operated flower shop in Lawrence. And I also worked with Home Depot and just uh, a, a flower v- yeah, uh, representative bringing in the goods and making sure everything's on display, looking good. He was like a rep for a plant yeah. company that worked yeah. with. So at this point, Oscar's going to preschool. Evie's, Evie's born. You've moved to this new city, and Jen, you're, t- you're teaching there. And, yeah. And this is 2007. So what, what's, what's, what, what happened next? Like, when did you make okay. this decision? And So, yeah, I mean, I think I was working in a good school district. We had a nice little house, but we were really living paycheck to paycheck. So I think that's the thing about the major impetus, if you want to know, like, the summary. you It's so hard to survive in teaching in the United States because, you know, it's different in Canada because you go to university and it's not outrageously expensive. If you go to a state university in the United States, it's like $30,000 a year for a public school. Yeah. Um, so that's a lot of money you invest in your education. So I went into teaching thinking the benefits are going to be great. It's, you know, decent money. You get raises every year. Well, that all changed, especially in my state. I worked in one of the best districts. Yeah. Um, so the state started cutting benefits. So at first, when you first got the job, they're like, yeah, we'll insure your whole family. Health insurance is another factor. You guys Mm. don't have to deal with that, but it's outrageously expensive. So if your business is not paying for your health insurance for your family, it's like a thousand fifteen hundred dollars a month just to have health insurance per person or for the family. For the family, but yeah. like you know, that's part of why I went into teaching because you had that premium of you know. So the, that was included in your package, but then they took that out. So then, then it was like okay. Then the state was at a budget shortfall, so they cut my salary and they stopped giving a raise every year. Like normally when you teach like every year you get a little bump every, you know? Yeah. Um, And then, but to, in order to maintain your teaching license, you have to like get a bigger degree. Like you can't just every five years I have to submit um, college credits to show that I'm still, still okay to be a teacher. And so I have to pay money and, and to be part of some sort of like uh, alumni or to continue no, no, no. your education, my actual license to say I'm a certified teacher. Yeah, you have to take so many courses every college five years. courses every five years. That's insane. So you and usually as, work towards your master's. And, and every then, every teacher at every high school has to do this. Every much. teacher in the U.S. Every state is different. Your, every state is so different. So how would they be taking these courses online or? Well, I mean, no, I had to. I mean, that's why I have summer. my master's degree is because. At but some, I mean, you're you're teaching, and then you have to go yeah. take a course at night. Or in the summer that's or insane. yeah, yeah, for sure. Who that's all right. So anyways, so it got to be a lot and we decided I had a friend who ended up overseas um, and she's like, you should do it. It's so much better. And my dad, um, he used to take me traveling to Latin America when I was a kid and his friend was a principal of an international school. He's like, this is what you should do. So I signed up for a headhunting service and there's recruiting agencies. So Working for them. No, no, no. To get them to get me a job. Yeah, okay. there's all sorts of fairs and stuff. You go to yeah. job fairs and you, you yeah. interview. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Cattle call. So anybody who's a teacher that wants to make that huge move overseas, it's pretty challenging to do it entirely on your own. There's tons of recruiting services. Some of them are free. Some of them have a fee. Um, and they'll help you get a job. So so you, you made this decision to uh, enroll into this uh, headhunting yeah. recruiting agency, which I, I'm familiar. I understand that I did a little bit of that before. Um, with the intention to go teach internationally. Yes. Yeah. No. And the country. No, no specific. you just, can't Was pick. it kind of just like, you know what, let me see what happens. No, you can't. I mean, the thing is, is you can't. No, I mean, for you, you're just oh, like, yeah. Let, let's yeah. roll the dice. We, whatever comes to the table, let's deal with it then. China wasn't even really on our radar. And I wasn't even a teacher yet until we got overseas. But yeah. you know, she's getting all excited about it. I'm getting excited about it. The opportunity to get our kids that, you know, we always want to travel, but we can never really, we're in Kansas. You can't really get anywhere quick. Yeah. And, you know, like she said, we're living paycheck to paycheck, got car insurances and all these things, that, all these monthly payments that are just kind of hanging over us. 
So yeah, she goes to the job fair. She's calling me every day. It's like, oh, I got an offer for Morocco. I'm talking to a school in Qatar. I'm, uh, the school in Italy sounds great, but they don't pay very well. And then, you know, she met a good director in in China. She connected with or a principal, and she's like, what do you think about China? It's like, well, okay, you know, yeah, that's how it happened. Oh. Yeah, and and. So we, you moved to Lawrence in 2007. When did you make this decision to the headhuntings? Uh, what year was that? I think we started 2011 because we you have to recruit a year out. So basically okay. the hiring season in international schools is different than schools in the States. Like in the States, you know, it's like two months before the school year starts, there's still jobs and they're still interviewing people. But internationally, you really have to put your resume and everything out there uh, like November the previous year. Yeah. So, yeah. So you... Now, this hen tender is saying, what about China? And you're, you're contemplating, and, and where was that in China? Qingdao. 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 Where the, the beer is from. Where the, where the Qingdao beer is from. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, I mean, it was funny, you know, um, before COVID, they did fairs, like in-person fairs. So we flew to, I flew to Boston, and it was in a hotel, and you did, it was like speed dating. It was super weird. You get there, and like, the schools like from all over the world, like have their signs outside of their hotel room. It'll be yeah. like, this person's from Mexico and this, and then, and you do the interview in the hotel room, like on. So all the schools are interviewing every, all the candidates that they yeah. brought over in China. No, it, it's oh, it sorry. in Boston. No, it's in Boston. In Boston. Boston. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Okay. So it was like a whirlwind. Like I'd interview in one hotel room for a job in Morocco. I'd interview okay. in another hotel room for a job in Dubai. And it was like, it was like playing around the world. It was oh, really God. weird. And no Thailand. There was no Thailand room. Um, I think, no, there wasn't a lot of representation from Thailand there. Thai, Bangkok is one of the biggest fairs too. So they probably rely on teachers that have yeah. already been overseas and, and in the Asian market already. There's a huge are, fair are in Bangkok. Are these schools that are, that are showing up, they're, they're, are they tier one schools? There's a gamut, a huge spectrum exactly. of schools for okay. sure. Yeah, I mean, there's some shitty schools. So you went, you went through... Uh, Various different countries, and and what happened next? Who? How did you make the decision, or did they decide for you? No, it's gonna ultimately gonna be our decision. Yeah, I mean, like there was, it was like wheeling and dealing. There was one school I was dealing with. They're like, "We'll get you a car when you get here. We'll pay you this." And it was like, "But you have to make your decision by one o'clock." I was like, "You know, I feel like I'm getting sold a used car here. I don't really want that." And then I met this really great principal who was teaching at the school in Qingdao. Shout out Kyle. 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 Opera. Yeah, he's um, the best. he was great. He just seemed super honest and it seemed like a community. It didn't feel like it was, a lot of the schools are big business. Like these international schools, a lot of them are run by like corporations. So they're like, it feels big business. Yeah, mm. there's big money too. Um, I wasn't quite ready for the Middle East at that point, so. Well, yeah, that one school you're talking about, the, like owned by the <laughs> emirs and. Yeah. Um, big oil. Money. Uh, it's uh, different groups are opening, uh, yeah. owning them or or, yeah. or corporations. We're talking about having like, I don't know who it was, but Pete Sampras or someone coming through and yeah. doing a, a tennis lesson. Yeah. And My God, that's crazy. Yeah, so it's it's kind of crazy. Um, but we ended up in this small school. It felt comfortable, and we were there. Um, four or five years. Yeah, four or five years. Uh, that that process. So we, I think we jumped ahead a little bit too quick. So. You, they, they found you, you made the decision. What were those small steps that you guys had to take? I mean, there's a lot of stuff back home that you oh, would yeah. have had to have done. And I think that's, that's the more, it's very interesting for people that if they are listening to this and they hear that because those small steps are scary. Like how do you wrap up your life here? And move it? So, yeah. Yeah. So w when you, you met that school. You said, okay, I, I'm going to make the decision. Before you get on that plane, what had to happen? Yeah. Um, well, we were fortunate enough. We went in. My mom was a traveling nurse, and so we went into a house with her together. So um, In Kansas. We in had Kansas, a house. Yeah, in Lawrence. And so, you know, we had to put that on the market. We sold our cars, um, which that part is was great. It's like just unburdening yourself with these uh, possessions and these things that sort of tie you down these monthly insurance payments. Finally, we did pay off. We had a, a beautiful little Honda Element. It was great. Yeah. But, you know, it was great when we paid <laughs> it off. You love that car. I did like, love that car. Beautiful Honda uh, so Element. That headroom. <laughs> so you, you sold this thing. We yeah. sold it. Sold it to a friend of mine. He still has it. Um, we were very fortunate. We were, you know, it's the hardest part is cutting the ties with your friends. Mm. And mm. But, you know, they're excited for you and we see them on the summers when we can. But um, the material things, I think. The material things, yeah. Shagging, uh, 
shedding ourselves with all that stuff was just uh, yeah, what, what, like all, all your your stuff. I mean, you you can all, pretty much only bring clothes with you. Let's be honest. Well, it depends on where you get a job. Like some schools will. Um, sh- they have a shipping allowance and most schools do. So they'll be like, yeah, we'll get your stuff on a container and ship it out here. Well, what's the point? I mean, you're not going to bring a bed and couch. <laughs> oh, and no, no, right. That's right. So yeah, yeah. it was basically stripping it down to the things that were important, which can seem scary. But when, when you actually do it, you realize like, Stuff isn't that important. Like no. most of it's ninety nine percent of it is replaceable. You're decluttering. Yeah. And and th- isn't there such a sense of relief when that happens? Of course. Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, every time I move, I, I love it. I'm like, oh, nine, at least thirty percent of the stuff like I donate. I'm like, oh, I haven't even looked at this. Right. Years. I think it was important, like keeping the the few important things. The biggest issue for us was the records. Oh, oh, we had a record collection. So. Yeah, may- maybe the collectibles and the memorabilia. Yeah, you can't bring that with you. No, but you can get a storage unit, or leave yeah. it with friends or family. Leave it with friends or family, and it's usually it's not that much. Mm. I mean, Rec- it, it's not going to take up that much space or square footage. Records are bulky, but um, uh, well, yeah. It, yeah, it depends on how much. Yeah, that's something else. You had to cut down the collection quite a bit, and I, I got a crate or two still at my mom's house. Fortunately. Um, we we t- we slowly take them back too. Yeah, we we've actually you every know, year we kind of take a, a few more. China, but. So, mm. uh, but yeah, no, I think I think that the hardest part by far is just um, renegotiating your relationships with people. I think that was the biggest step. And so, if I had advice for people who were going to make what, a big what, step, what do you mean by that? Renegotiating your relationships with people. Well, because the grandparents can be easy. Like you're taking, I don't get to see my grandchildren anymore. I don't get to see them yeah. month to month or how, yeah. what, several times a year, depending on how far away they lived. They feel like they're missing out on um, seeing their grandkids grow up and having a, you know, an influence in their lives or just, you know, being, yeah. being a participant. And so I think where you're going, um, go ahead and fill in, but um, you got you to gotta get them out there to see where you are in the space overseas. Yeah. It, it really bridges a lot of gaps and they can see once they see you thriving and actually, you know, living a better life overseas, it, they're just, then they're just on your side. They're, yeah. They become part of your team again. And not that they weren't part of your team. They just don't necessarily understand it without experiencing yeah. it themselves. And I think it's different for U S citizens because a lot of people in the U S don't travel internationally. I mean, only 40% of our population has a valid passport. Right. doesn't mean that they actually use it. They're going to Mexico. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. They're not going or Canada. They're going. They're going to. <laughs> they're going to Canada Cabo. to get their. Yeah. yeah. Maybe Bahamas. Yeah. Exactly. So I mean, I think, I think that was like the biggest thing. And now that we've been overseas for so long, and we've made new friends who are new to overseas, that's the issue that just keeps coming up. Like, gosh, like I, it feels like renegotiating these relationships with my family. And like we said, just bring them out here. Like, just suck it up. Fly them out here get them to see what you're seeing and then they have that shared experience and it just actually brings you guys closer together. So I think that's the biggest hurdle. Like stuff is stuff. But you they're can... retired now and could they come out? Could they live here? No, I don't know if they'd live here. Thailand would be a different situation. China's not an easy place to bring in your... No, 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 no. So Because that's uh, that's actually the other hardest part. Yeah, China, that that's... An, Impossible. Yeah. Like getting the visa. Well, actually, it wasn't that bad getting. We've no, gotten but visas it's, it's, for, it's not going to be a permanent thing. Like no. I think Thailand, they, you could have your parents retire yeah. if they wanted to. I'm I'm basically retired. <laughs> In my <Congratulations>. mind. <laughs> In my mind. Yeah. It's Friday. We're doing podcasts. <laughs> we're looking for uh, sponsors. No, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sponsor uh, your retirement. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's that's it. I mean, that's the reality. Anyways, um, so. But visas are another hard thing. So, like, I think that's. That's a big step. Like your stuff, don't worry about it. It's just stuff. Your your relationships with your family, you really need to be proactive about taking care of those and really nurturing them. And like I had to like, you know, you have to get some, sometimes you might need help with that. So um, yeah, and we've, we've been in a position where we can fly our parents out. Just like, we want you to be here. So, you know, we'll buy you a plane ticket. We'll put you up. We'll take you, we'll show you, we'll take you to some great tourist spots and in China, but they're coming as tourists. Yeah. They're coming yeah, as yeah. tourists. Yeah. Yeah. You get like, whatever, how long we can stay for about a month. Oh no. Now, now they can, my mom has a 10 year visa. Oh yeah. She could go to China if she so wanted that, to. That, that's probably <laughs> the most intimidating, a- the, the most intimidating aspect of traveling abroad or living abroad are these visa processes. Mm. And I think mm. a lot of people, um, 
when you first hear if you first hear the word visa you probably think mastercard if you've never traveled yeah you have no idea like what is it you mean i need a stamp on my passport a document to allow me to get into your country because i think coming from places like canada and the u.s we feel very privileged what do you mean your country wants a document have you seen my passport type of mentality yeah so that process of getting the the legalized visas to stay in countries is probably the biggest headache it's a headache but there's always a gray area and there's always a loophole but it's a question of talking to the right people and finding that so to to give those people that are looking for that opportunity like uh what would you say to calm them down on that step of the process first of all make sure that whoever's bringing you over like our school i think that's a hallmark of of a legitimate business like or a company it's like what what is your visa process like you should ask that straight up front like what do you need what is what is my responsibility and what is your responsibility because i think getting that cleared up up front is is going to help you so just to be like i want to see what i need to get done and what i need to pay for because those costs can be a lot. And if your company or whoever is bringing you over is not covering those, that might be something, you know, that you, you don't plan for. It should be a red flag. It should be a red flag. So yeah. I think the communication right away with whoever's bringing you over, if you're doing it by yourself, I guess it's fine. But, you know, and then um, just being, I would say we used a visa service, which was super helpful. They always, I, honestly, visa services it's are the way it. to go. It's worth it. Yeah, it's when when you're doing visas, uh, TMT visa service. Yeah, give hey, me Bruce. my next visa for free. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, yeah, but um, from living in Asia for twelve years, it's and worth like, it. I avoid real estate agencies because I don't want to pay them commission. Right, but visa services deserve every damn penny. As long as they're legitimate, I think if they're legit, yeah. but they. Just make life so much easier. You do it so much faster, too. They're just like, okay, we've done your paperwork. We've done this. Everything's good. Can you send me a stamp? Right. Or sorry, can you send me a passport photo and a birth certificate? Right. That's it. And the, the document auth- authenticate, uh, whatever, apostilles, and that stuff is, is a lot of work to try to get, you know, your marriage certificate and all this kind of stuff, depending on the country. It has to be certified. So. Yeah, and especially going to China, I remember when I had to, I did the work, the Z visa or Z visa, um, <laughs> Z's dead. Uh, the ZZ. <laughs> um, when I did that visa, I, I remember I, I literally had to like crack open, well, not really, but where my diploma was framed. And I had to <laughs> arrive yeah. in China with the original document of my diploma. And it just, it, it's actually probably still in my closet here. Uh, multiple diplomas yeah but the other thing as well is uh the health check when you arrive oh, did yeah. you experience that as well oh, yeah. yeah of course so weird yeah, you so just weird. get through it whatever yeah it's like, well, i think they'll allow you to do it if you do it in your home country yeah, you and you can get a certificate but yeah that was pretty funny right like you show up and then they like bus you to a hospital and then you go from like room <laughs> to room they like make you pee in a cup and then they take your blood and then they like do an ultrasound of your stomach they make you take i mean like i was yeah. The shock. care is really good. The facilities can be a little bit shocking at first. Yeah, we had we've had some shocking facilities. Do you think it's a, a it's a scam? Not against you, but just to be in the system, being like we're part of the process. Pay us. Because um, it's I did it in China and like it was really strange. Or or is there some our school always is it genuine that. behind that? Like are they actually trying to uh, make sure there's no people coming out? coming with major disease into yeah, the I country. Think, I think, I think so. I think it's like you the have same. to do it to get your visa certified by the government. Like you have to like present this paper that says you've, you know, mm. you're you're free and clear and you're not going to die on them or burden the system. So, yeah. yeah. So now when you guys go back, um, and, and I think the point of that story is it's the same idea. It's the journey and to show people it's not that complicated it to go isn't. overseas. And a lot of people, they, they fear the change of, well, I got to get rid of my car and my house and my memorabilia and all this and that. Yeah. I mean, come on. You can literally throw that stuff in the garbage tomorrow at the end of the day. And trust me, in 10 years, you won't even think about it. Well, I think you're right. Like the whole thing too with COVID, like everything's temporary. Like it's just, you're, you're not here forever. So. Yeah. yeah and, you know, I guess going back to the educational side is that I think we had a better opportunity for one to get these our kids into better schools than the public system 
in America and just the even greater education of exploring and, and interacting with this world and, and getting firsthand accounts. They've been to Vietnam, South Korea, Cambodia, um, all, many places in China, obviously Thailand. Uh, Egypt. The exposure at that yeah. young of an age, like, well, I didn't have that, and I'm yeah. sure you guys didn't either. No, not no. at all. Yeah, that's it's so, priceless. Yeah, their, their perspective of, of being back to a global citizen is second to none, I yeah. think. Yeah. So. They're, they're better than us. <laughs> yeah, they are. That's the, Hopefully, that's the that's point, the point right? Yeah. right? Like, that's the end goal. Oscar's downstairs <laughs> watching this live. Yeah. He's like, yes, I'm better than them. Yeah, but no, they I mean, that they have, we didn't gain that perspective till yeah. much later in life. At least for me, it was 25 plus or, or whatnot. <laughs> I can't tell you how naive we were about <clears throat> whatever, pre mis mis preconceptions about what China was or what Asia was in general um especially china yeah. i mean because i mean let's be perfectly honest like your education in the in the west about what china is is absolutely different than what it actually is well it's what you're, you see as well but i think that's just because our access to media back then is not as you know wide true. today i mean yeah. now you can turn on youtube and see that's what, true, see what that's you true. Want. but then we we're we are given a certain you know narrative of what china was at that you know in the 90s and early 2000s yeah mm. it kind of it tricked your mind of what the hell am I getting into however living in China for the first two weeks is a bit mind-blowing <laughs> yeah I like, mean you're there, overwhelmed there, there's like there is a learning curve oh, oh there's yeah. a you know huge I mean? learning curve so like but once you learn to ride the bike you're like oh this place is easy you, but before that you're like it smells to be honest yeah, and it, it's the, and it's it can be the pollution it can be the styrofoam it, or sorry the, the burning styrofoam it can be the sewers oh. That only lasts about a month because like they say, yeah. this is why like if you have bad breath, you don't smell it because your mouth is near your nose. So you become used to it, right? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, <laughs> no, th th that's true. So like in China too, or even t uh, Bangkok or especially Bangkok, totally. that smell of sewage, when I'm out there, I'll be with fresh people that are, you know, off the plane. They're like, it smells horrible here. I'm like, I can't smell it. I think your brain eventually, like... You, I, don't, you, you I think at this point I had traveled I, a few places. So I had been to, like, you know, different countries. And, I mean, even in, in develop like, New York. I mean, like, there's a smell. Every oh, subway is gross in New York. Your olfactory is actually... Your sense of smell has the strongest tie to, to memory and, like, uh, nostalgia and all that kind of stuff. So I think smells really... I've always kind of paid attention to it. <laughs> yeah. But when I moved to China, it was definitely like, oh, this is, it smells strongly outside. Like not, and I'm not saying bad smell. I'm just saying that it's pungent. It's yeah. yeah like there's spicy smell or there's, okay, yeah. you know, like seawater. Cause we moved to Qingdao. It was like, there was just so many new dried fish, like people drying yeah. shrimp on the street. Like, like outside. Like, yeah. Outside, today yeah. I was like, what is that smell? Dry fit. Or, um, my favorite smell <laughs> is, um, Washing the washing machine. I know oh. Thailand has a, like a laundry it. detergent smell for me. And, like it's, it's always smells like clean clothes. It triggers vacation. <laughs> so like you, you can be living in Thailand. I know we're kind of digressing here. Um, uh, you can be living in Thailand, and I can be driving around, and you could have a shitty day, and uh, maybe I just had you know, a double cheese whopper, and I shouldn't have done it, <laughs> and and whatever. But then like you get the smell of the detergent yeah. yeah, and like it triggers something in the, in your brain. That's like immediately you feel you're on vacation again. Mm. I don't know. I get this all yeah, the time. There's those little la laundry mats everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. That and and the, the, the other one it's for me, I, I, I like it's strange is I like the smell of burning garbage. Oh jeez. Okay. It's, but it, it's almost the smell of like incense uh, or, or uh, it's like smells of Indonesia. To like, me, it smells of my childhood and like the country where. Yeah. yeah so like, so <laughs> yeah. I start to think of like, okay, camping, fire, yeah, vacation. Yeah. yeah. But then you look over and it's like, oh, that's a pile of burning garbage. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, my where I'm from, I'm from Kansas, Missouri. They burn garbage there all the time. Well, there so. we go. <laughs> the funny thing about like so. China too, you also obviously get the durian smell very. Oh yeah, durian. very distinct. But then you also, in certain places, you'll get the the stinky tofu. And they can be really pungent. But as soon as you try a good stinky tofu, the, the smell, smell doesn't bother you anymore. Yeah. It's not that bad. It's really good. Yeah. Yeah. The stinky, certain things like that. Chodofu? Chodofu. Yeah, I like it. But yeah. No, we're not talking Chinese <laughs> on this part. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, but smell, you're right. It ties really closely to memory and emotion. And I think for, for me, like traveling and 
experiencing new smells, like it, it mm. let yourself experience them because <laughs> it'll bring back something like the smell of uh, diesel and. Uh, what is the plain, smell of uh, Qingdao or, or Dalian? Like, is there a distinct smell you could take from there? Beer. Beer. <laughs> Beer. <laughs> Vomit. <laughs> Vomit. There's a lot of barfing that, that happens. Of, yeah, people just kind of like let it out and keep going. I mean, Qingdao's a huge I don't want to say anything. Culture. I really love the city. Like, But, you know, you, like you said, you, there's a lot of restaurants on the street. They just throw their excess waste sometimes in a bag and just waiting to be picked up. Sometimes it smells like hot garbage on, in the summertime. Yeah. So. So to, to to jump back on uh, onto the main point of the discussion there, um, of of with that idea coming to you came to Qingdao first, yeah, Shout right. Out. So you get off the plane. Um, was there anxiety? What were, you, were, were what were your expectations? I mean, you must have visually saw yourself, you know, for months getting off the plane, coming into to to Qingdao, coming to your apartment. Was this all arranged? How was that first experience coming into China? We had a representative, uh, representative from the school to pick us up in a van, take us, put us up in a hotel room uh, for two weeks if we needed it. Otherwise, um, you know, they put you in contact with their own real estate agent right away, help you get an apartment. And yeah. then as soon as you're ready to move in, you, you move in. Um, this is well before the start of the school year. And so it was, it's, it was pretty seamless. And I think we tried to go in with as few... Um, concrete ideas in our mind of what it would be and just go in there with an open mind. I don't know if that's what it was. Were, were you guys trying not to overthink it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Which is hard for me because I overthink everything. Mm. Um, but I think when we landed, we stupidly thought like we, there's a lot, if you fly into Qingdao, your, oh, your yeah. stop is probably Incheon, like in South Korea. In Seoul. In Incheon. 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 Yeah. In Seoul. Seoul. Yeah. Seoul. Oh, so basically, no, you're talking about the Incheon, the airport. Yes. But okay. it's, a, it's a, yeah. Area. It's a city. It's an area. Is it? Yeah. I'm yeah. confused. With Seoul's okay. huge. Seoul's, yeah. yeah. So we, we flew into Incheon and then we had to stay the night because a lot of those flights, um, and we got quite used to that over the years because that was our point of exit to get back to the US. But we first arrived there and we're like, whoa, look at this. It's so modern and like, you know, all this Korean barbecue. And orderly. we're like, oh, it was so orderly. And we were like, this is what China is going to be like. And we <laughs> stupidly, like, because we'd never been to China and this was like our first major experience. Like, I'd been I'm to shaking like, my head right now. I'd <laughs> been to Turkey, you know, I'd never been anywhere else in Asia. So I was like, oh, yeah. This is just... And then we got over to Qingdao. We're like, oh, this is like, how did we even, th we're so dumb. Like, how did we even think that this was going to be the same? We're so stupid. Although yeah, <laughs> Seoul is like on the level of Hong Kong and Shanghai. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not Qingdao, not even Shenzhen. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Oh, no, Shenzhen. Yeah, it's getting there. It's yeah, getting there. Shenzhen's pretty amazing. So you, you get off and then they, they I, they're taking you in the minivan to take you to the hotel to allow you to take time to find your own place. Yeah. Um, that that process of looking for your apartment. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, it's, it's pretty it's seamless. seamless yeah. Pretty normal. Like they just wanted how far do you want to commute to get to your school? The school did provide a bus home. You had to find your own way to the school. So yeah, but you're with these agents and they're not. They're speaking English. Oh, well, we had a representative from the school. Oh, you guys. God, you guys did it the easy way. Yeah, I was pretty easy. Oh, yeah. Mine was like way off the beaten path. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. We had a, we had a, f a, a, a representative from the school, but the agent spoke decent English and it wasn't, I don't know. It wasn't that bad. That was easy. Yeah. yeah. And, and at the end, do you feel your, your price you got was, was quite fair or was there a bit of a, something going on between the school, the agents and all that stuff? Nah, we weren't getting gouged for being no. foreigners. Mm -mm. No, that's, okay. so. that's good though. That, and that's important for people to you hear. You can get well. gouged. Oh, absolutely. I mean like, and you have to be careful with these real estate agents because when we moved to Shenzhen, it wasn't it, part of our school's package at the last school. And that's another thing is you learn that every, every business, every negotiation is different. It's not like it's, you can expect the same type of contract from where you move from one place to the other. Yeah. Because we came to Shenzhen, they were just like, you're on your own, yeah. figure it out. So we had to find an agent. We had to find all that kind of stuff on our own. Yeah, because you're, you're making that move and they're just, they, at that point, they feel you can do it on your own as well. I just think the school wasn't, like they, they yeah. just didn't understand the, because mm. most of the people well, lived in apartments on yeah. campus. Are they ready now if this happens? Are I they think so, yeah. Okay. They're better. They're better suited. Uh, yeah, that's the thing is like that school actually provided housing on campus. And so if you were to be one of the few people to arrive and move off campus, then you're kind of like, well, you're on your own. So, yeah. But whatever, that's it was fine. And we had already know how to navigate China pretty well at that point. So Yeah, so so you're, you're getting in, into... Now, Qingdao, it's, it's a different city than... Dalian, right? Oh, it's way different. It's across. Uh, I've been the to Dalian, but I thought they're still quite, 
quite close to each other. They're close. Are they, are they a, a car drive or a plane flight? No, or a plane? It's around the peninsula because like, Dalian's right there by the North Korean border. And you have not to. Not very far from the North Korean border. You have to go. What yeah. are, sorry, are you, dri- are you driving? Or? As the crow flies, it's fast. But if you were to drive, you'd have to go all the way around the. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So what, like an hour flight? Yeah, it's yeah. an hour. It's, oh, it's really close. So then you're flying. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And. Uh, as you come into the, to Qingdao, you're you're getting set up. They gave you two weeks to get yourself like comfortable f- before you start school. Yeah, and you find your place. You get all set up. What's going on at home with the kids? What's going on with you? And this is a nine part question. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then and then how was that like first day getting into school? So maybe starting with Lex of like your side of that, and then we'll move into Jen's side of the first day. I don't, you know, it's, and it's harder now to, I think, make the jump overseas with a trailing spouse. Like, like I said, I wasn't a teacher until I moved to China. So I got there. She's the only one who has a job secured. I've done a lot of different things. I can do graphic design online, obviously. Um, but I, I was open to just exploring and seeing what I could do. Um, fortunately, I was approached within a couple of weeks of, of uh, being a, a teacher at the Ocean University. Uh, it's a pretty prestigious college uh in chinese standards yeah and just teaching english to uh english majors like lower level guys um and french majors and yeah. no, that was weird too <laughs> that was weird but um yeah, yeah but you you can find something there you Everybody, can always find everyone something. can find yeah, something yeah. You, yeah. you could go to a english whatever Were you doing it legally wall street no yeah for sure um i was fortunate enough to already be under her visa so they didn't have to do much paperwork for ah, me okay um, so yeah, I was fortunate to get that experience, get my feet wet, see if I even like teaching. And then I started, I started hanging around the school and helping out with the basketball team and just, you know, hanging out in the art classroom and doing some demonstrations. So in th- this process, this transition was quite quick after landing. Like, yeah. uh, you, you proactively started looking for something to do at this point. Uh, were, were the kids now going to the school as yeah. well? I so mean, Evie yeah. was old enough. Yeah, they had a preschool, yeah, uh, okay. like kinder two. So right. that wa- that worked out perfect. You yeah. don't have yeah. to wor- worry about that. Okay. Yeah, it was pretty straightforward. I mean, I think a lot of it was, uh, we had a crazy landlord. So she was great. We loved her, but we were on the first floor. And I think a lot of it was getting used to like dealing with what the expectation was with our relationship with her. She would, she would garden. She had a garden outside of our window. Right oh, yeah. She'd just stand outside staring in our window as she like watering her flowers. To her and that's like where we would hang our laundry. So like you'd go out there to grab a pair of underwear and like Mrs. Lee would be right there, like <laughs> waving at you. So that was kind of like, why she was Snoopy or she was a little, she's, she's a little busybody, but she was just always there. Was watering she her older? Yeah, yes. Yeah, she's oh, older. Okay. But she also made like Jowdza and like hung she, around with our kids. Maybe she's and, just yeah. lonely. No, she, well, I don't know. She there, was fine. Was like, there a man in her life? Oh, yeah. 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 He was there. Oh. But you, th- that's a funny thing, too. Like, when you paid rent, sh- he, he She would, handled all the finances. Yeah, he would not accept the money. Like, he was like, no, my wife accepts the money. So if I came to the door, like, paying rent, he's like, she's not here right now. You have to come back. <laughs> oh, yeah. Maybe he had a so, gambling problem. Yeah. Probably. So, <laughs> Marjan. so that, that that was quick, your, your transition. You got into the school and kind of everything. Did you have any hiccups, any... Oh, yeah, plenty. Um, ...issues that, you, you know, like, uh, you would have done differently? So... Qingdao is known for their beer and their beer festival. So when we arrived in, <laughs> oh, yeah. when there we arrived go. in uh, August or whatever it was, that was beer festival time. So the city gets an influx of people from all over China, all over the world. People come to this beer festival. I and think it's like second to Munich. Yeah, it's really? huge. It's yeah. huge. Well, Qingdao is German. Yeah, it's made. a German brewery, it's right? German, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it was a German, German brewmaster. Master. Tasted yeah. like water, but anyways. <laughs> and they were they had a little settlement there so there's german architecture some german uh c- catholic churches and stuff like that yeah um but like i said so just the influx of people all the so we went we went down to this uh food court you know had a lot of, like you, we were told they had good indian food so we went to go check it out but there's just it's packed wall-to-wall people drunk people and yeah, yeah people of all walks of chinese life. and foreigners all, mostly chinese yeah oh, okay. but foreigners too um yeah, anyways, we were, you know, I told the kids, go get a spot, you know, go find a table, I'll go get our food, I'll wait for our food, and then I'll bring it to you guys, whatever. And then, so they're waiting there, I'm over there waiting for the food, and I see a commotion, and it's right where... Our kids are. Where they are, and these two guys got into a fight about whose seat was whose, and one guy picked up a whole tray of hot soup and flung it at the guy who's in an argument with, 
It missed him and hit Evelyn. And oh, so she, shit. she got immediately like, I've never seen burns like this. Uh, she had a, uh, a mushroom, a hot mushroom. Yeah. Yeah. This is, in retrospect, she's fine. It was it's not fine. that big, but there's no scars or anything, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's, it was alarming. Yeah. They're like people scatter. The guy who threw the soup darted out of there. I guess the security guard caught him. And so we're like asking for help. Oh my God, my daughter's screaming. She got, you know, burned. Yeah, it's, it's not third degree, yeah, but yeah. it's... Yeah, yeah. it's but, th but to be perfectly honest, like immediately, like Chinese people rushed to help us. Actually, the foreigners would not help us. Yeah, they wouldn't there was a table of foreigners next to us and they would not help us. But these Chinese people rushed in, like they were like, had, you know, I, I can take you to the hospital. I can do this. Like, what do you need? Yeah. So we got her there. She was totally fine. I mean, that was an experience seeing like. So yeah, she takes uh, Evie to the hospital. And takes, he goes to the police station I have to go to the, the police station with Oscar. And they're basically like, well. How, how much, much do you want? How much do you want? It's like. Really? What? We had never dealt with anything yeah, yeah. like that. We're like, he calls me. He's like, they're asking me how much money I so want. how much did you take? I can't even remember. It, it was, was maybe not like, much. But you, you ended up, you could take it. Yeah, it's like, well, you, I was like, I don't know, like well, a, the, a thousand RMB. To like, pay for no, the hospital bills. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But and this is. The cop was like, no, ask for more. And so I was like, yeah. oh, okay, uh, 7,000 RMB. And like, yeah. He's like, yeah, okay. You could probably get it going more. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was so foreign. We, just wanted, like, we were like, like, what? We just want to be done with this. It was weird. Yeah. It was, that was, that was and, in our first two weeks. And the guy was there. Yeah, he was standing they, right across they, from me. Yeah. I just, it took everything to not jump across, but I'm I'm, yeah. I'm in China. I'm not trying to get in trouble. You yeah, know, yeah, I just got here. Mean? And it's he didn't mean to do that uh, to he her. Was a, no, but he was being a he total was a dick. dick. He was being yeah. smug in there and like whatever. Yeah. yeah. But and, and what's fair to say, like just so the Chinese government doesn't kill us, <laughs> um, this isn't just China. You get these assholes in every country. Oh, oh for sure. Right. Yeah. No, we're absolutely Which is saying fair that. to say. No, we're just saying that beer festivals probably draw they of anywhere course. in the world are going to draw drunk people and assholes. I think to be perfectly fair, I think in 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 northern China there is more of a a culture. They like to haggle. They like to argue. They like to debate. And I think that's totally fine. I mean, I I think that's kind of a a social okay thing. So. That was different. This Shenzhen is, doesn't feel so much like that. Yeah, Shenzhen's. Well, Shenzhen's a melting pot, right? Yeah, it's definitely so people it's, from it's, all over. There's not like you can't say these are the people from Shenzhen. It's almost. I mean, they're they're they're. Far, uh, it's a fishing village. Yeah. So no one's really from Shenzhen. No. So, yeah. And I I, I kind of miss like the northern like there was some haggling <clears throat> like there. They enjoyed a good back and forth about stuff. Well, they they have so. their traditions, their yeah. cultures, and like and it's it's probably. Cool quite apparent as you move mm. around that mm. that those areas like it's it's prevalent it's consistent you're seeing this happen more, more yeah. and more it's and a massive Shenzhen, you, do, you don't know who the hell you're meeting on no the street. Yeah. no yeah. no and that's what's cool about Shenzhen too you get a lot of different dialects and accents you know when you're writing in but their mandarin is a lot clearer mm. yeah yeah that's it was easy to learn mandarin down in uh yeah down in Shenzhen and, and taiwan but uh up in the north, I couldn't understand what the hell. So there's saying. lots of hiccups. So anybody who's going to move overseas, like there's a, there's just going to, as long as you realize there's a learning curve, yeah, and you're just, you're going to figure it out. It'll, it'll be fine. It'll and, be it, fine. and if you're doing the international teacher route, there's already established communities. People are, they want to help mm -hmm. you, you know, get um, acclimated pretty quickly. So, you know, we always look out for each other. You know, if if you're new overseas to the our school or even just a neighboring school, you know. We're happy to take you out to dinner, show you where to go, yeah. Yeah. tell you what's what, or try to help well, anyways. At the end of it all, though, like, if you were to look back on your entire experience, would you do anything different, and would you do it again? I have no regrets. No regrets. No, I'd absolutely no. do it again. Would you sure. do anything different? Like, mm. like in terms of maybe, like, like, some sort of planning, would you go to Qingdao? Would you prefer Shenzhen? Would you live in Phuket for the rest of your life? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't do anything different. I think uh, one thing that I did do before I went, and I think this is something you can do, especially if you're like me, who tends to be somebody who wants to like overthink or over plan to help you keep an open mind. Just, I used to listen to like Chinese radio stations or like find some travel shows that are, mm. you know, or read, read a book or a historical book about, so you can understand the culture to where you're going. Because I think, you know, the biggest thing, why people move overseas is because you're seeking to connect to something else. And I, if you go in there with um, a respect and an understanding of somebody's culture or their history, or, you know, 
that really helps spark conversation too when you're trying to learn a language because yeah. you can say, oh, I know this, like this this food culture or this, like pick something you're interested in, art, food or something. Instead and, of just being a robot. Yeah, instead of just being a robot or just being yeah. an ignorant like Westerner that goes somewhere and thinks that, you know, everything's going to cater to you. Reach yeah. out. I think that's the biggest thing you can say to somebody is don't over plan, but find a point of commonality and a point of interest that relates to their culture so that, when you meet people, you can have something to talk about. Yeah, and at least you can, like, relate on their cultural yeah. level and that they don't look at you. Uh, you don't feel like a tourist in a tourist area. Exactly. Right? Watch a lot of Anthony Bourdain. He's got, a good, of, yeah. he's got yeah, a good yeah. approach. Yeah, yeah and it, it, it is. You're trying to take in the, the local environment, yeah. which is very important. And um, I think that's true anywhere you, 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 you travel. Now, that's difficult when you go to certain places where you are traveling because, I mean... You have a limited amount of time. How right. much can you take in? But definitely when you're living in a place, do try to absorb as much as you can and learn about the culture and don't uh, fall into a bubble. Because it's fair to say that even in places in, in Toronto, like you have Chinatowns and they fall into their bubble. Oh, sure. well, they're, they're like what we yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. They be, could be having a podcast in Chinese in Toronto and not speak a lick of English. But... It is what it is. Yeah. So Nothing yeah, you, you gotta if you want to experience the culture, it's it's, it's something important. you have to dive into. It's difficult, but well, yeah, you seek. Of course, that's like why you always have those. We like Lex was saying the the community of expats. Of course, you always have that. But I think um, you know even even when we go back to America and we go to like places. If if somebody's there who is maybe a first generation immigrant. And we speak Chinese. They're like, oh my god! Tell you should tell the story of when we were going, we were driving through to from Arizona <laughs> to Kansas. Yeah. yeah, and we we had to stop for the night because we couldn't make it there. We're in like some podunk town, podunk in like, town outside of Dodge, Kansas. Sit, yeah, mm. and uh, so we stop at a motel for the night, and there's this lovely old Chinese couple basically doing the same thing so from China, just doing yeah, a road trip. Their their road trip in, in the U.S. Yeah, 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 in, in U.S. And they're just having the most difficult time at the uh, reception desk. The lady at the desk is asking, "Is like, I need your license plate. Tell me your license <laughs> plate number." And they're like, "And like, Ting Budong." She's like, "Ting Budong, oh, mish, mish, mish. And and um, she's like, "I don't speak Spanish." That's what the lady. <laughs> <laughs> and it's oh, like, she doesn't know. No, so she doesn't know. But oh, okay. Um. <laughs> anyways, she jumped in. and Was like, "Oh." Uh, I started speaking to him a little bit in Mandarin, like, yeah, and yeah. I was like helped them fill out their thing. And they were so thankful. Like they knocked on our door later and they just had like an armful of cup noodles that they had brought from China. And they were like, you please take these. And we're like, thank you so much. But yeah, I mean like they needed those too. Yeah. But they were, they were like, there was no, you couldn't not accept accept them. It was like, it had been insulting if we didn't take some of them. So, but yeah, they were, I mean, I think that's the thing too. Um, language. So anybody, if you're moving somewhere, even I know Thailand's different because the language is quite challenging. It's very difficult. And we, this is such a expat heavy area. This, yeah. But Thai is at a level of Cantonese. It is so, I've tried. Yeah. I'm not bad. I mean, I have a base, but to take it to, I'm probably like a two out of 10. Yeah. Maybe a 2.5. What's, <laughs> but to get it to a seven or six, my that God. That takes dedication. Oh, serious dedication. But a few words will go Goes really a long, a long a way. A little yeah. attempt. Yeah. yeah. It's enough for, they differentiate you immediately. Mm -hmm. So like there's so many levels or layers, let's say of like the tourist or the foreign, let's say the foreigner in Thailand, like you have the tourist, the short term tourist, the travel transient tourist, that's maybe going to Cambodia. Right. Then you have like the, the expat, uh, maybe it's someone on a three month, uh, business trip, the English teacher for six months. And then you have the person that lives here one year, three year, and then you have the five plus year people. Yeah. I'm kind of the five plus year. And yeah, when you learn a couple of those uh, enough, if you can learn enough to make them laugh and talk in that, yeah. they don't look at you as a tourist. They're mm-hmm. like, oh, you live here. And, and, and that's comforting. Yeah. Because yeah, sure. when you're out, you know, no one's fucking with you. Yeah. Right. But, like, or you know that you're part of it. I mean, it's like to me, it, and it's really hard. Part of the community. Part of the community. And yeah. in China, that's hard because there is such a, I've never been somewhere. Yeah. It's, even though it's not really truly homogenous, there is a, this idea that there are outsiders. So you kind of want to do as much as you can to, to be an insider. Yeah. Or be part of the community mm-hmm, so. because they're quick to help. And I think that that's kind of probably a misunderstanding that like 
if if you speak any any Chinese at all, they're so they are excited. so excited and so yeah. patient. They will wait for like ten minutes for you to respond, and they will help you. So I think. You know, that really goes a long way. Yeah, because they know how difficult it is to learn as well. But yeah. actually, a lot of people, Chinese is not that difficult. It, really it isn't. It's I not so bad. I don't think it is. Mandarin's no. not so bad. I really don't think. Yeah, no. Mandarin, sorry. I don't think it's I mean, bad. my Mandarin's not, it's abysmal for how long it's I've probably lived there. Good. But it's, I mean, you can make minimal effort and yeah, it's, not even it's formally. Not, and Thai is it. on yeah. another level. Yeah, I agree. I would say if, if uh, Mandarin's like, uh, to learn, I would say it's like a, Four out of ten difficulty. It's just the first three months are hard. Yeah. Thai, honestly, I feel like it's an eight out of ten difficulty. I it is that. very hard. There's actually a spectrum you can look at. Um, oh, of language learning. Yeah, difficulty. of language learning difficulty, and it's yeah. like um, they they you <clears throat> pick where your like your home language, uh, and okay. you can do a scale of how challenging another language. Gotta check be. that yeah. out. I'm yeah. sure Thai's got to be up there. I'm sure it is. English is pretty hard though, isn't it? It is for some people, but like actually, you know, Mandarin's they've actually said is harder than Swahili. I think it's on that. Like you can like literally look to see how Mandarin's harder for English speaking people. Oh, okay. But I don't know. I mean, it's I, I'd have to look at it again. All but right. Well, on that note, I need a bathroom break. If you guys have anything to plug, this is not hot ones. That camera, that camera, that, <laughs> that's your camera. Uh, if one. you're plugging anything, uh, maybe your social media. I mean, Lex ha crushes sunsets. <laughs> How do we find uh, it? Sunset Boulevard. That's all right. Um, I don't really, I'm not really pushing subscribers or followers. Uh, like, if you want a logo, we can talk. But uh, this was yeah. a really fun experience because, you know, I was, when we first met, you started throwing out these ideas of this uh, whole inception of, of what, you know, you got a guy you can get some good supplements from. And then, like, it evolved into... Oh, well, you got to build the brand in a certain way and, and then tap into like pe what people are doing in, in Phuket. And uh, it's just been really fun to be part of the process, even as Yeah, as it went is. from an idea to yeah, and you, yeah. room. It's just cool that you're actually doing it. You, 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 you keep pushing it further and further, and it's been fun to sort of, you know. Yeah, so we're plugging me, guys. It's a lifestyle. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Like, plug us. We're doing our thing, so we're just teachers, you know, raising kids. Um so yeah, if you want to buy some kids, yeah, <laughs> we got joke. kids for sale. <laughs> and on our side, uh, subscribe, swipe left, swipe right, uh, do all that stuff. Um, like it, bell notifications. Uh, mushroom supplements will be coming out. Sorry, this quick, quick to the point. I really have to go to the bathroom. Um, uh, we'll have awesome podcast next week. I'm not even going to tell you who's coming on. It's massive. Gordon Get Ramsay. ready. It's Gordon Ramsay. Gordon Ramsay, guys. <laughs> We're out. Bye.